going to talk about a couple of topics today that uh, we can call unusual pest problems. And uh, these are problems that either are not here in Ohio yet or happen very rarely in Ohio, but it happened recently. And my two main topics are first, soybean gall midge, and second, fall armyworm, which was a big sort of outbreak surprise pest in Ohio this past uh, summer, in late summer. Now, soybean gall midge is, uh, I call it a gotcha pest because we don't actually have it here in Ohio yet, but it is an emerging soybean pest in the western part of the soybean belt. So we're talking Iowa, Minnesota, the Dakotas, Missouri. And it has been an emerging pest since 2018, and it has been spreading. And it has really caused quite severe damage uh, to parts of uh, these states in early season beans, particularly in June. Now, this is not in Ohio yet, but its range is expanding every year. And based on what we know of the biology of this so far, there's no reason why it couldn't be here eventually. So I just have a few slides just as a, a kind of head up warning type of topic so that uh, if you should see this, that you know what you're looking at and you can um, alert us right away because it would be important to know if and when it arrives in Ohio. So this is the range that we have seen. And this, this is a new species. Uh, it actually had never been described as a species before it showed up in this part of the country in 2018. And all of the counties in red are where it showed up in 2018, pretty much at the same time when people actually started to look for it um, due to severe damage in certain counties. Uh, red uh, is where we first saw it. Uh, orange is the counties where it was first recorded in 2019. Yellow in 2020, green in 2021. So you can see that this is a, a spreading pest. Just very briefly, what you would see if you saw this, they uh, burrow into the vascular tissue of the stem of the soybean plant and they look like little orange maggots. Actually, when they're, they're little babies, they're sort of more of a yellowish clear color, which you can see in this picture. This is one of the more immature larvae. And then this orange larva is uh, the mature version. Now, this is actually a type of fly. And this is the maggot of the fly. And you will find them feeding in the stem near the base of the soybean plant. And that base will turn sort of black and necrotic from the feeding that gets done there. And it's, you can readily identify if you have black stems by slicing them, slicing the uh, outer part of the soybean off, um, that will reveal the maggots inside. Typically, the early signs of infestation happen in late June. And one of the first things farmers may notice is the, the plants are wilting. And this is because the vascular tissue at the base of the plant has been destroyed. And my colleagues who have been working on this out, particularly in Nebraska, they've done a lot of research on it. And they have found up to 100% infestation on field edges going 20 or more feet into the field and up to 20% infestation in the rest of the field. So in this series of pictures, you see a plant that's wilting. Uh, this is the, the maggots inside of the stem. And here is that black stem that is the giveaway that there is a problem. Uh, field edges. Um, will be hit hard, plants may snap off easily, sometimes the stems will be swollen. And this series of pictures just shows different stages of damage uh, that occur in the development of the plant. So this is just a heads up, as I said, uh, we hope we won't get it here, but if we do, if you do find this pest, um, please contact your county extension office or you can reach out directly to the field crop entomologists in the Department of Entomology, that would be myself, Kelly Tillman, or my colleague, Andy Michael. So the next topic, we're gonna to shift gears and talk about uh, a pest that really took us by surprise this past August, and that is fall armyworm. 
And even though this is a, you know, I've been generally given the topic of soybeans, this is this is a pest that affects a lot of a lot of different crops, and it can impact particularly double crop soybeans. But I'm going to talk about it in kind of a more broad, general sense. And uh, I put this in here because I think people are interested in this problem that we had, and uh, it was kind of a big deal in August and early September. It was noted in the media in the Cincinnati Enquirer. They uh, observed that fall armyworms were marching across Ohio and Kentucky, causing damage to crops and grass. And it wasn't just our area, it was pretty much the whole Midwest. And this is a national headline from USA Today. Unprecedented outbreak of armyworms are destroying lawns across the US, often overnight. Now, it is actually not quite unprecedented. This has happened before. It has happened in Ohio before, but it's been a while. And when this started happening, we started talking to people to find out when was the last time anybody knew of this. And uh, some of the older farmers we talked to can remember an outbreak like this in Ohio when they were boys in the 1950s. So that's about 60 years ago. So indeed, we did see Tremendous damage to turf, uh, fall armyworms like grassy plants, but they are not restricted to grassy plants. We saw uh, extensive damage in alfalfa. Uh, this is an alfalfa field stripped to the soil by fall armyworm caterpillars. Uh, we saw extensive damage in other types of forage, such as this clover hay. And this next video, I think our very own Mark on panel here sent me this video of a mower head after mowing hay. Yeah, so shout out for that great video and sorry for showing it after lunch. Oh, we also saw sporadic damage in other forages and double crop soybeans where those are grown uh, further south in Ohio and also in uh, fall seeded crops in particular winter wheat. As I said, this has been about 60 years. Now, we need to take a step back and understand where fall armyworm comes from when it does arrive. And it is more or less a tropical species. It cannot survive freezing temperatures. And the only place in the US where it can successfully spend the winter is in the far southern parts of Texas and Florida. And the typical pattern is that overwinters there and then in the spring, the populations build up and then they migrate and spread to other areas. Typically, we only really see damaging populations in the southern US, but we always get a few uh, that make it up into Ohio in the fall, but, but not to damaging levels. Never really something we've had to worry about in terms of infestation in late summer. So what happened this year? What was different this year? Uh, well, as per usual, we got our moths from the southern U.S., um, but it was a lot more than we usually get. So what happened? You know, and I call it a perfect storm because there were three main things that happened in conjunction this year that gave us the kind of problem we did. Uh, in the southern U.S., they had particularly high infestations this year. They always have some problems. They had really bad problems in the South. So we had a big buildup in the South and we had the wrong weather patterns at the wrong time. And we had high temperatures in many parts of the Midwest at the wrong time. So I'm gonna take a slightly deeper dive into each of these. So in the Southern US, they had a particularly warm winter and spring, which was good for the fall armyworms overwintering there. They survived well and they got an early start in the season. There was also abundant rain in the spring in the southern US, which gave the early weeds a jump start, which provided a, a great food source for this early population of fall armyworm to build up on. And all of this contributed to being uh, a lot more population in the south than typical. 
then enter the wrong wind patterns at the wrong time. And when this problem took us by surprise in, in mid-August, we did a little detective work to figure out what happened. It was kind of retrospective what happened this year. And uh, Aaron Wilson, our climatologist, made these maps for us looking at the wind patterns. And the first thing you'll see is uh, around July 27th, we had a wind event from the south central US. So scooping moths up from that Texas area uh, where they had built up to large numbers and depositing them pretty much over our area in the Midwest. But this pattern of wind it wasn't just a one-time event, it continued. And then we had very strong and consistent winds for, for pretty much a whole week in uh, August, August 6th through 12th, which again, scooped up populations from the Texas area and dumped them over top of us. And this August 6th to 12th um, wind event maps nicely with uh, what we were able to put together after the fact about when egg masses started showing up. So uh, Curtis Young, one of our OSU Extension educators, traps for various moths. And uh, he pulled at the end of August, around August 13th, he pulled a trap that had been sitting out uh, from August 5 to 13. And he found bunches of army worm egg masses attached to the trap bottoms into the vents nearby. So this maps ni nicely with that um, August 6th to that week of August 6th where the wind was blowing up from Texas. And shortly after that is when we really started having problems in the field crops. Now, the third part of this picture is we had a much hotter than average temperatures in Ohio starting around August 6th. In this heat map, the more orange something is, or the more red it is, the hotter it is than the average. And so this was the week of August 6th, we had very warm temperatures. And this is important because this is a tropical species. It's very heat loving. And so the conditions were just perfect for them when they arrived. So I'm gonna go into the biology a little bit. A fall armyworm. We do, you may have heard of armyworm in Ohio before, and there are actually several different types of armyworm species. We have true armyworm, beet armyworm, yellow striped armyworm, and true armyworm in particular. We do occasionally have pest problems with small grains early in the season from true armyworm. But fall armyworm is a different species. And uh, the Latin name, I like to put this out there because I think it's kind of interesting, Spodoptera frugiperta. And frugiperta means lost fruit because of the damage potential it has for agricultural products. Uh, I think I went over all this already. Um, it has a very broad host range, a very broad feeding range, and it does prefer grassy plants, but it'll eat just about anything. It'll eat legumes, clover, soybean, it'll eat corn. They'll even eat each other if they are uh, crowded and hungry. They will go cannibalistic if uh, no other foods are available. And the, the main area of threat here for us is a late summer crops and fall seedings of winter wheat and fall seedings of cover crops too, for that matter. And the life cycle um, during the summer when it's warm, the life cycle lasts about 30 days. Uh, and about half of that time, two weeks is spent in the caterpillar stage. And that is the feeding stage when the damage happens. Now, insects always develop faster when it's warmer. So in the spring and the fall, when it's not as warm, that life cycle might be closer to 60 days. And the number of generations that we have really depends when they arrive in an area and get going. In, in Ohio last um, summer, we had the August generation, and then we had a partial generation, next generation in September, October. They start out their life cycle as eggs. And I have a few more egg mass shots after this. Those eggs hatch into caterpillars where they spend anywhere from two to three weeks, depending on how warm it is. 
they go into a resting stage, a pupal stage where they make their transformation to the moth. And then the adult moth is the dispersal phase where they will fly around to new places or get caught up in wind columns and transported. So these egg masses are, there's many, many little eggs all covered by kind of a, a fluffy sort of almost looks like a, a fluff insulation uh, coating on top. And the color will vary a little bit depending how old they are. And egg masses that are darker are those that are closest to hatching. They tend to uh, lay these egg masses, the moths lay these egg masses uh, on flat surfaces that are a little bit protected. So you'll often see them on fence posts or light poles or on the sides of buildings. And then when these hatch, we get our little fall armyworm hatchlings. These little tiny, um, little tiny guys are the neonates, the new caterpillars that hatch from the egg masses. After the neonate, they go through six larval growth stages. Uh, we call them instars. So we have a dividing line here between the first, second, and third instars. And then I've drawn this red line uh, between them and the fourth, fifth, and sixth instars. And I draw this line here because this is kind of an important from a management point of view. The smaller the caterpillars are, the easier they are to kill. So your best time for chemical management is in this first to third instar. By the time they get to fourth instar, about three quarter inch long, anywhere from three quarter to one and a half inch long, they become much harder to kill. And the sixth instar, this last instar is also relevant because they do about 75% of their lifetime feeding during this last stage. So instars one, two, three, four, five, they do 25% of their lifetime feeding. And then this big old fat six instar, it's gonna do 75% of its life, lifetime feeding all in the period of just a few days. And that's why it takes people so much by surprise. They'll, everything will look fine. And then two or three days later, the field is gone because uh, they went into this like massive eating overdrive stage at the sixth instar. Identification can be a little bit tricky with the moths. There's a lot of just kind of brown moths out there and it requires a bit of expertise to identify a fall armyworm moth. The caterpillars just at a glance um, uh, can be a little bit deceptive because they can come in different colors. They can be anywhere from like a, a yellow to a almost a dark brown. Stripes may be prominent or stripes may be subtle. But there are a couple cat uh, cat uh, excuse me, there are a couple characters you can look at on the caterpillars to help with identification. You want to look at the caterpillar head on and at the uh, head capsule and look for the inverted Y. And if you look at this area right here, you see this upside down Y. And that is a pretty good character to tell you it is fall armyworm. Another pretty good character, particularly with the larger caterpillars is a characteristic series of four dots that occur on the uh, tail end that are grouped together kind of like you would see four dots on a die, on a dice. They do have some natural enemies in the places where they live year round. There may be specialist parasitoids, parasites, but those parasites don't tend to make the trip with them when they migrate. There are other generalist predators in agriculture that will feed on them. Ground beetles, soldier bugs, a uh, uh, big favorite of mine are the birds. And that's because you will often, your first clue that you've got an infestation of fall armyworm or really any other caterpillar in a field is all the birds are flocking there to eat. And so if you see a bunch of birds hanging out in a field, it's really worth investigating what's going on in that field. But even though there are a number of things that will eat them, these are often not sufficient to prevent, prevent an outbreak in an outbreak year. 
So let's talk about some specifics of management. And as I said, it's much easier to kill them when they're small, that is less than three quarter of an inch. And at this stage, many standard uh, one chemical go-to products will work well enough. Uh, for example, Warrior, which is a pyrethroid. Although we do have some evidence that there may be resistance developing in some strains. Now the bigger caterpillars, those that are bigger than three quarter inch, as I said, eat a lot over a three to six day window and they're harder to kill. And at this stage, many of your go-to one ingredients insecticides may not work very well. And so it may be useful to use multiple modes of action. So mixing a couple of products. Now, we do not have research thresholds in Ohio because um, of the rarity of this event, but we do have some guidelines that are borrowed from southern states. And a general rule of thumb is whatever crop you're in, if you have three or more caterpillars per square foot, you're probably going to want to treat as long as it's not too late to treat. And another little tip is these caterpillars are nocturnal. They do most of their feeding at night, so the best time to scout is at dusk or at dawn. In pastures and forage situations, it's easiest to go through and monitor with a sweep net. And the very best management advice in forages is if the hay is anywhere close to harvest, harvest is as soon as possible. And like, don't wait a day or two because you may go out and find half the crop gone. Just really get out there as soon as conditions permit. However, if they are large, one to one and a half inches, it may likely be too late. And another interesting point that was brought up to me at a CCA conference is that if you have really heavy infestations in a hay field and you harvest, you're gonna have to take extra steps to dry. You're gonna have to work harder and be more vigilant about drying out that hay because you're gonna have all this caterpillar goo. And if you bale it up, you're gonna have rotten hay. Now, if most of your caterpillars are smaller and uh, you want to try for chemical management, maybe you're nowhere near harvest and, and that's just not an option, uh, a good approach is to try for uh, two modes of action, uh, a knockdown and residual control that will keep uh, working on controlling them for longer until you can get to that harvest. So by a knockdown, I would mean one of your simple pyrethroids like Mustang Max, Ferrati, Warrior, and then mix that with uh, a residual. And two examples of residuals that work well, which are insect growth regulators, uh, Dymalin and Intrepid, these are uh, actually stop the insect from growing well and sort of interrupt the caterpillar's ability to mature. Uh, and so these work best on small caterpillars that haven't matured yet. And these, these products tend to have a residual of seven to 10 days. So they'll, that's the period where they'll, where they'll keep working. But uh, a caveat is they won't provide particularly good control after rain. They're not very rain fast. Now, more expensive, but much more rain fast are a couple products, Provathon and Besiege, which can last up to 21 days residual when used at the highest rate and tend to be more rain fast. Now, soybeans, uh, uh, you're particularly likely to see problems in soybeans that are near grassy habitats or that have a lot of grassy weeds because that will attract the moths in the first place and they'll come for the grass and stick around for the soybean. And under high pressure situations, a couple of go-to products that have been recommended to me by colleagues in the Southern US are Prevathon and Vanticore and Besiege or Intrepid Edge used at the five ounce rate. Now this past year, we did see a smaller next generation in the fall in Ohio. And part of that we attribute to the fact that this past year we had the warmest October on the books in Ohio since records started to be kept in the late 1800s. So we did not get that first frost, which would have knocked them back right away. We had just a warm, long, warm August where they were able to keep living and feeding and some 
crops where we saw at least some economic damage, nothing like what happened in August, but we did see some problems in winter wheat, uh, fall cover crops, and alfalfa. So let's say that you do have an end season crop in an outbreak year and you're concerned about it, what do you do? Well, our advice is for fall seeded crops plant as late as possible. So that way you're minimizing the period of overlap between when they are at their, the caterpillars are at their best and you're trying to push the crop a little bit later than that. That cool weather is really gonna slow down the caterpillars and the first freeze is gonna kill them out pretty quickly. If you do have new plantings, uh, watch for small caterpillars and kind of decide, do I have just a few? Do I have a lot? If you have a lot and you're concerned, take a look at the weather forecast. Um, is frost expected? Is it gonna be really cool day and nighttime temperatures? That's gonna slow them way down and maybe you don't need to worry. Or on the other hand, if you have a lot of caterpillars and it's a warm forecast, uh, spray them small if you're gonna spray them at all. Now, why, why am I going into all of this? Uh, if this is a once in a 60 year event, why even talk about it? Why learn about it? Um, I think it's not possible that we are gonna see this again and not in 60 years. Um, mainly because climate change uh, is going to encourage, I think, more frequent outbreaks in the Midwest. We are, uh, what happened in the South with warm, wet winters and springs, we're probably gonna see that happening more often, which is gonna, give us larger pop starter populations more often. With climate change, we're also gonna have strong weather patterns. So we're already seeing that, you know, tornadoes taking out Kentucky in the, in the fall. These are just gonna be part of our life and these events will be more frequent to transport the caterpillar the moths to our area. And as things warm up, we're gonna have hotter temperatures in the Midwest, which is a more favorable environment for fall armyworm. So these are all reasons why we need to be a little bit more vigilant. And in fact, uh, we never bothered to include fall armyworm in our monitoring network. We monitor for Western bean cutworms and we never really included fall armyworm because well, it just wasn't a problem. But uh, this, this summer we are going to institute a fall armyworm monitoring um, and starting around August 1st, we are gonna monitor for the influx of moths so we don't uh, get caught short again, like we did before. And so we are going to be more vigilant about that um, within OSU Extension. So that is all the material I have for now. I wanna thank all of the, the uh, support for soybean research from soybean checkoffs and especially uh, Ohio Soybean Council and the North Central Soybean Research Program. <laughs>